diagrams with uh, lines off the mass shell. For example, in our model theory, although much of what we say will not be restricted to our model theory, but I'll use it continually as examples, this is a typical Feynman graph <coughs> with lines off the, which I choose to evaluate not just with lines on the mass shell, but with lines off the mass shell. In the first instance, that is an interesting object because it could be an internal part of a more complicated Feynman graph, as I explained at the end of last lecture. Um, for notational simplicity, I will uh, only deal with graphs with external meson lines. The, uh, Extensions to graphs with both external mesons and nucleon lines are more complicated kinds of theories where you have 17 kinds of particles and 17 different kinds of external lines is trivial. I will not assume that the only particles in the theory are the mesons, just that the only graphs we're going to look at are those with external meson lines. <coughs> I will consider the sum of all graphs with four external meson lines to all orders of perturbation theory and use that to define an object, which I will indicate by a shaded blob. Each of the external momenta is labeled K1, K2, K3, K4. And as in our discussion of crossing, all Ks are oriented inward. They're all incoming momenta. And therefore, for energy momentum conservation, their sum must be 0. Since we're off the mass shell and dealing with space-like momentum as well as time-like ones, there's hardly any point in adopting any other normal, any other orientation convention. <coughs> I will define this blob, the sum of all graphs, to be an object I will call GN twiddle of K1 to K, sorry, G4 twiddle of K1 to K4. It is the sum of all graphs with four external lines. Uh, there is some uh, con freedom of convention about uh, how I define these graphs. I will define it so that it includes all delta functions, including the overall energy momentum conserving delta function, which we've previously been factoring out of our Feynman graphs. <coughs> all disconnected graphs, that's rather trivial for the four point function, but of course we're going to consider things with more than four lines shortly. So I will have all disconnected graphs. And all propagators, including the propagators on the external lines. That's just a convenience. If this is an internal part of some more complicated graph, Say this one, and I draw a dotted line about the internal part I'm studying. It's a matter of convenience whether I put the propagators on these lines inside the blob or outside the blob. I'll put them inside the blob. That will turn out to be uh, later a convenient thing to do. To give a uh, definite example that I really am including everything, let me write down uh, the first few graphs that contribute in our theory to G4. The first few graphs that could be here, if you knew there was a blob somewhere inside a graph and all that you knew were that four lines went into it, and then in particular, you could have zeroth order contributions, in which all that happens is that the four lines go right through the blob and don't interact at all. 
plus, of course, two permutations, depending on whether I match up K1 with K2, K3, or K4. And then there will be corrections, of which the first one will be the graph I have put on the board, and as friends of order G fourth, I guess meson-meson scattering in our theory begins order G fourth, although all other scattering processes begin order G squared. Analytically, this equation would be G four of K one, K two, K three, K four equals from this graph two pi to the fourth delta four of K1 plus K3 plus, because all of our momentum are oriented inward, I over all, well, it doesn't matter, K1 squared. It could as well be K3 squared. Delta fourth of K2, sorry, 2 pi to the fourth. Delta 4 K2 plus K4. I over K2 squared minus mu squared plus I epsilon plus two permutations corresponding to the two other ways I can pair up momentum with K3 plus order G squared. G fourth, thank you. That's the way to do it. Don't raise your hand. Just shout it out if I've made a, 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 a slip of the chalk. Yeah. One on the yes. That's right, because if that were an internal part of some other graph, and you were using the Feynman rules for that other graph, you would only have one propagator. Yes? What? Yes, there should be a twiddle on the piece. <laughs> because I'm, I'm shortly going to uh, define the Fourier transforms of these objects, which will turn out to be, in some ways, have more direct physical meaning than these objects themselves have. Um, of course, uh, if you have these things off of the mass shell, you have them um, on the mass shell as well, simply by putting the lines on the mass shell. So therefore, we can, if we know the G twiddles, compute the S matrix element. In the particular case we're studying at the moment, G4, we have, for example, <coughs> K1 prime. <coughs> K2 prime, <coughs> S minus 1, K1 comma K2 equals, where K1, K2, K1 prime, and K2 prime are now on the mass shell momenta. We firstly have to cancel out the four propagators that would appear on the external lines of this graph by our dump convention that I have just introduced. product are equal, well, over the four momentum. KR squared minus mu squared. That's to cancel out the four propagators we've put on by convention. We now take them off. G twiddle for, well, it's symmetric. How I arrange the arguments doesn't matter. But I'll say minus K1 prime, minus K2 prime, K1, K2. That's just our old formula for the S matrix element again, where I have undone the convention of extending the, putting the propagators on the external lines. Please notice, of course, that the two disconnected graphs I wrote down, that arise, the three disconnected graphs that arise in uh, zeroth order, uh, make no contribution to the S matrix, as indeed they should not, because they each have only one propagator, one pole factor, but we have four factors of zero in front of them. And therefore, they get completely canceled out. Martin, you have a question? Oh, yes, there would be higher order disconnected graphs in addition. Oh, order G squared disconnected graphs. Mm -hmm. Because we've made those things cancel only at a particular value of the momentum, the momentum on the mass shell. You're right. Because there are disconnected graphs. Okay, so this is our rule for the um, 
this is a rule for getting, if you have the G-twiddles, this just tells us that the Feynman diagrams on the mass shell are obtained by taking the Feynman diagrams off the mass shell and putting the lines on the mass shell and dividing out our propagate, eliminating the propagators we put in by convention. Um, of course, we can define uh, Gn in exactly the same way for n particle and external lines. And as you might guess from the twiddle, we uh, can define their Fourier transforms or alternatively define them as the Fourier transform of some object. d4x1, d4xn. Since all of these are even functions of the momenta, it hardly matters how I put the signs in in the Fourier transform, but I want to be consistent in my notation throughout these lectures. So I'll put e to the ik dot x1, e to the ik dot xn, gn of x1, xn. Can thank you. Now we can give another meaning to these objects, as I also stated at the. As, this is essentially just what I went through in the last five minutes of last lecture, just getting all the convention straights and the i's and minus signs. Um, we can give another meaning to these objects by changing the Hamiltonian of our theory and considering a combined version of, for instance, model three or some general theory involving a scalar field and model one. That is to say, we can take H and imagine changing it by adding to it a term of this kind. Where rho, as usual, is some, excuse me, I keep trying to steal your, uh, it gets into your zipper. <laughs> the zipper of his, sorry, the zipper of his, <laughs> of his briefcase. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> more fun than an inflated pig bladder. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> This lapster tradition will never die. I will now do a graceful pratfall. The, uh, the, uh, where rho, as usual, is uh, some smooth function that vanishes as x goes to infinity. Um, then if we are to compute um, a vacuum as vacuum in the presence of rho, or if we were to compute any S matrix element, but I'll stick to vacuum S vacuum, we have a new vertex in our theory, which I could indicate by a dot with a single line coming out of it. That is our row vertex. And the value of that row vertex, if I now orient the momentum K coming out of it outwards, so it will fit onto our other things where K is going inwards, is easily seen to be minus i rho twiddle of minus k, because the momentum is going outwards by this convention. Or since a k is, uh, or since rho is a real function, this could just as well be written minus i rho twiddle of k conjugate star. That is the value of that vertex, which in fact we computed in model one when we were doing model one. Now, if we consider <coughs> the vacuum S vacuum matrix element in the presence of this source rho, and if we are, for, we can of course expand things in power series of our new vertex, imagining we have already summed up all powers in all of our old vertices, and thus, for example, to fourth order in rho, what we get is this, where the blob inside is precisely the blob we have defined before. The four lines can do anything. They can go like this, or they can go like that, or then they can interact with various powers of g, and so on. <coughs> and thus we obtain a formula for vacuum s vacuum in terms of these quantities g twiddle which I will now write down. 
Is that point clear to everyone? I saw some blank expressions. You have the four lines coming out, and then they can do whatever they want with each other so long as there's no row involved, because we're only going to fourth order in row, this particular expression. <coughs> We usually define vacuum as vacuum in the presence of the source rho to be a functional of rho, a numerical function of rho, which we call z of rho. And the formula for z of rho, which we get in terms of the g's, is sum n equals 1. 1, that's the zeroth order term, I can't ignore that, plus sum n equals 1 to infinity, integral d4 k1 d4 kn, rho twiddle of k1, star, rho twiddle of kn, star, gn twiddle of k1 to kn. And there is a missing factor of minus i to the nth, because there's a minus i out here in the vertex over there on the right-hand forward. And there is a residual combinatoric factor of 1 over n factorial, which I will now explain. There's a residual combinatoric factor because this is a vacuum-to-vacuum -vacuum diagram, so a usual arguments that all the n factorials cancel do not apply. Why does 1 over n factorial is easy to see? If we imagine restricting ourselves to the case where this particular row gives up momentum k1, this one gives up momentum k2, et cetera, then all of our lines are well-defined, and we have no 1 over n factorial. On the other hand, when we integrate over all k's in this expression, we, over, uh, we overcount each of that, each of those, we count each of those terms n factorial times corresponding to the n factorial permutations of a given set of k's, and therefore we need a 1 over n factorial to cancel it out. Is that clear? I know the combinatoric arguments are clear to no one the first time they hear it and they have to go home and think about it, but do you think you'll understand it if you go home and think about it? If not, <laughs> if not ask a question now. But this is so set up that it is, can also be written as a, um, a formula in um, position space simply by the elementary, whoops, I'm sorry, I left something out and people should have called me on it. Our Fourier transform rules are arranged so that there's a, we, our Feynman rules say integrate over every internal momentum with a 1 over 2 pi to the fourth. <laughs> The, uh, our, um, is so set up so that it can be instantly transformed into a position space expression, which I will now do. Same expression, minus i to the nth over n factorial, now no two pi's, integral d4 xn, d4 xn, rho of x1 to rho of xn, Rho is real. The gn to x1 of x1 to xn. <coughs> the uh, g's are therefore revealed to have a second meaning. They're what are called uh, Green's functions. That is to say, a Green's function is an object that gives the response of a system to an external perturbation. George Green of Manchester introduced this in the early 19th century for a linear system, so he only had a single Green's function. Now we have a system that has a possible nonlinear response, and therefore we have an infinite power series in powers of rho. And that's why we call them G's for Green's functions. <clears throat> An amusing feature of this formula is that all physical information about the system, at least insofar as it involves experiments doing mes involving mesons, is embedded in the single functional Z of rho. 
If you know z for arbitrary rho, then you know the gn's. And if you know the gn's, then you know the scattering amplitudes. Of course, fat chances you have of knowing z for arbitrary rho, but nevertheless, it's sometimes formally very useful, and we'll give some examples of this, to have to, instead of manipulating this infinite string of objects, to manipulate this single object, z of rho, that sums up all information about the system. And z is sometimes called for this reason a generating functional. The, um, the words come from the fact that, as you know, in things like the theory of Legendre of polynomials or something like that, it's very nice frequently to have a generating function for the Legendre polynomials, a thing which, a single function of two variables, which when you do a power series expansion in one of the variables, has the Legendre polynomials for the coefficients. That's useful in proving things about special functions. This is the same sort of thing. We say functional rather than function because of a dumb convention that if we have a numerical function of a function, that is called a functional. And it is a generating functional because if we expand it out in power series in the rows, the coefficients are the Green's functions. You can play cunning tricks with these generating functionals, although that's really not the point of this lecture. A digression I cannot resist is that it's easy to write down a generating functional that gives you not the full Green's functions, but only the connected Green's functions. If you want, that's our old exponentiation theorem. Log z of rho. Remember, the sum of all Feynman graphs is the exponent for vacuum to vacuum is the exponential of the sum of the connected Feynman graphs. So if you want the generating functional for connected Green's functions, just the sums of the connected graphs, you just take the logarithm of this. C stands for, connects, include connected graphs only. That's a cute trick. Because the sum of all Feynman diagrams for vacuum to vacuum is the exponential of the sum of the connected diagrams. So therefore, you want, here's the generating functional for a full Green's function. You want the generating functional for a connected Green's function? Just take us logarithm. We won't use this formula, but as I say, it was so cute and so short to prove, I could not resist putting it down. We will, we will use it later. Now, all of this has been in the framework of <coughs> our old theory with an adi our standard scattering theory that we've been using until now, which where the, intera where the Ham interaction Hamiltonian is adiabatically turned on and off with a function f of t. The reason I've gone through these manipulations is to get a, um, a formulation that I can extend and prove Q I can extend to the case where f of t is not equal to, uh, is f of t is abolished, i.e. set equal to 1. Therefore, all of this is merely motivation, is merely heuristics from our new viewpoint to tell us what is a sensible thing to guess as a true formula. And I will now investigate matters in a completely new formulation where we've forgotten about all of our old theories, probably most of you have, forgotten about all of our old theories for computing the S matrix and are going to start afresh on the problem of computing the S matrix. What I will do is as follows. f of t is now always and forever set equal to 1. No more will we talk about an adiabatic turning on and off function. However, I can still take my Hamiltonian and add to it 
a term involving rho of x. I will now define z of rho as the amplitude, not the same formulas on the right-hand board, because I don't want to talk for the moment about bare vacuums, as the amplitude for getting from the physical vacuum to the physical vacuum in the presence of the source rho. The real honest to goodness Schrodinger picture U matrix between the physical vacuum and the physical vacuum. The physical vacuum is the real physical vacuum, the ground state of the Hamiltonian. I will assume I have normalized my theory so that it has energy zero. And of course, I've, I've added a constant, and I've normalized the state, of course, so it has norm one. Okay, that is how I'm now newly going to define z of rho. Okay, no bare vacuum in the picture. I have this real honest-to-goodness theory, which I can't solve. I complicate it to make it an even more complicated, insoluble problem by adding a rho of x, phi of x. I then wiggle my source, and I find out when the source is wiggled, what is the amplitude that I'm still in the vacuum state. Now, I don't write S matrix because I don't know what the S matrix is yet. <laughs> the, uh, yes, sir? Well, it may be one of 17 fields that appear in H. It is one of the fields that appears in H. It has some dynamics. Rho, on the other hand, is simply a C number space-time function which I control. I define Gn twiddle, Gn, as before, as the successive terms in a power series expansion of this thing in powers of rho. I now want to ask two questions. Question one, is Gn the sum of Feynman graphs? It's not the same definition as before, but of course it's not the same theory. We no longer have an adiabatic turning on and off function in perturbation theory. This is a question that is linked with perturbation theory. Whether the sum converges is not a question I will strive to answer in this lecture or indeed in this course. <laughs> yes, sir? No, that's the real Hamiltonian without the row term. Okay, the real full Hamiltonian, it's the real honest to goodness ground state of the world before we start fiddling with it by adding the interaction with the external source. Okay? Perhaps I should call this H super rho, just to make life clear and say this is this thing in the presence of the source rho. Will that make life, make the notation clearer for you? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, we do our best. We do. without the rho term. Otherwise, of course, it's a time-dependent Hamiltonian, and it does, there's no point in defining a ground state. Okay, it's the real physical ground state of the theorem without the rho term. Does that make it clear? <laughs> okay, good. Now, this question we will answer within the next half hour or so, and the answer to it will be Yes. <laughs> Question two. Ha, huh, I, can, I can make it hard for you to take notes by <laughs> using a fossil from a previous portion of the lecture. <laughs> Question two <laughs> is... <laughs> Okay, is that still true? This is a question that has nothing to do with perturbation theory. It is a queer, we have this object that is well defined without reference to perturbation theory and any coupling constant lurking inside script H. Okay, 
We've got this object. Maybe we got it by being a genius and summing up perturbation theory. Maybe we got it because an angel came flying through the window with the answer on a golden tablet. We have this object. <laughs> Question, do we get the S matrix element by applying this formula? And of course, the corresponding formulas, which I will, will pain of death will not force me to write out for other types of scattering matrix elements, two into three, two into four, et cetera. <laughs> Answer, which will be established not this lecture, but next lecture. Almost. There is a correction. <laughs> and I put a question mark and an exclamation point there because I want to preserve some suspense. So since we're going to go through the long, the long derivations, and we'll find out what almost means, either at, towards the end of this lecture or towards the beginning of the next lecture. This program, when completed, <coughs> will give us what I described in an earlier lecture as a real scattering theory. That is one where you have a formula that tells you how to extract the S matrix elements if you can solve the dynamics exactly. That is the formula on the right-hand board, to which you combine a formula for computing the dynamics in perturbation theory, the answer to the first question, and thus develop perturbation theory for S matrix elements. However, if you have some other approximate method for solving the dynamics, I know, variational method, regipoles, uh, dispersion, you know, whatever method or some method that has just appeared in the latest issue of physical review letters, it doesn't matter as far as this part goes. That just means you have a different approximation for the right-hand side. This formula is exact, and you can feed that in to get the approximation for the S matrix element. And now, is it clear in everyone's mind where we plan to go? As I say in this lecture, I will probably only get to, um, to answer <coughs> uh, question one. Well, I hope that's as far as I get, because I didn't bother to write up the answer to question two. <laughs> so, uh, yes, sir? How are the defined? We will define in and out states will actually construct in and out states, define the S matrix as the matrix element between an in state and an out state, the inner product of an in state and an out state, as when I was sketching out non-relativistic scattering theory, and then show that it is, aside from a correction factor called wave function renormalization, aside from a correction factor, it is given by this expression. Okay, but we will build in and out states. We'll do the real thing with a certain amount of hand waving, but uh, <laughs> do we still, do we still have to ask the No, we will prepare ourselves to ask it by, we will have to define the S matrix without an adiabatic turning on and off function. Now, <clears throat> I now turn to something that will occupy me, as I said, for the next half hour, the answer to question one. Let's see, I want this formula. I'm not going to be talking about this for quite a while, so let me erase this. I do, will, firstly, develop a formula for these Green's functions that has um, uh, nothing to do with perturbation theory, but gives me an expression for them that is nevertheless will be extremely useful in comparing with perturbation theory. I have a Hamiltonian that is h plus rho phi. I'm going to investigate this Hamiltonian by Dyson's formula, not by Wick's theorem, just by Dyson's formula. And I'm going to split it up into a rather peculiar way. I'm going to treat this part as if it were h0. I'll put quotes around it because later I'm going to break this up into an h0 plus h prime. <laughs> and I'm going to call this part h prime for the moment. That's my freedom. Dyson's formula says I can divide things up into a free part and an interacting part any way I please. Of course, in this way of doing things, the interaction picture field is the Heisenberg field. That is to say, the real honest to goodness Heisenberg field when rho equals zero. Be 
because the interaction picture is always the Heisenberg field when you throw away the interaction Hamiltonian. Thus, we can apply Dyson's formula to compute this object in exactly the same way we applied Dyson's formula in the other case. Thus, I find <coughs> no S matrix yet. I haven't talked about the S matrix. Time ordered exponential minus i integral d4x of the interaction, quote, unquote, Hamiltonian in the interaction, quote, unquote, picture. Just the same old Dyson's formula. I've just broken things up into a free part and an interacting part in a different way. And this, of course, can be expanded in a sequence of powers in row. I can't use Wick's theorem now because the Heisenberg field, you know, doesn't commute till have C number commutators for arbitrary separations or anything like that, but I can still expand the power series. And this is the physical vacuum. I should have put that there. The ground state of quote H naught, just as before we had the ground state of real H naught. For N, time ordering, I'll stick out in front, physical vacuum minus i to the nth over n factorial of x1, oops, sorry, integral d4xn, d4xn, rho of x1, dot, 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 rho of xn, I'll have to continue it on another line, phi h of x1, phi h of xn, physical vacuum. Are there any on h itself? Nope, just said it to find some sensible quantum mechanical theory. I don't want to talk about an h that doesn't have a vacuum state. <laughs> okay. But otherwise, presuming it has a vacuum state, We'll always presume that H defines a physically sensible theory. The problem of proving that any given H is, uh, def does define a physically sensible theory is reserved for Professor Jaffe's classes. <laughs> okay, we'll assume that it defines a physically sensible theory. Otherwise, absolutely no restriction. <coughs> now, <coughs> comparing this formula and this one, it is the work of a moment to find a very useful expression for Gn, to wit, Gn of x1 to xn is the vacuum expectation value of the time-ordered product of the Heisenberg fields x1 to xn. the same formula. Here you've got Gn defined as before, except Z of rho is now physical vacuum, S, physical vacuum, physical vacuum, and a U instead of an S. Here is the expression. Here is this expression. They are term by term equal if we make this identification. Everything else comes out right, the minus i's and the n factorials. Of course, that was my cleverness in establishing my original notational conventions. Thus, we have a second meaning for the Green's functions. The Green's functions are quantities that measure the response of the system to an external source, and they are in position space, simply the physical vacuum matrix elements of a time-ordered string of Heisenberg fields. Any question about any step of this derivation? Don't look stupid when you can ask questions and let everyone know you're stupid. No, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say that. Don't, don't just give me blank stares. Please give me questions, because if you're puzzled about something, it's likely someone else is puzzled also. Okay. Now, this is one side of the question we want to answer. We 
we've defined what g of n is according to our exact definition. We will now want to study what we get by summing up Feynman graphs. Okay? So the next question is, what do we get by summing up Feynman graphs? <coughs> well, the Feynman graphs are rules for determining the matrix elements between the bare vacuum, we were always manipulating annihilation and creation operators and hitting them against the bare vacuum, of matrix elements of the U matrix. So the Feynman graphs, Z of rho as we would compute it from the Feynman graphs, we're going to show it's equal to our other Z of rho in a moment, but to keep, to keep from uh, confusing things, uh, uh, assuming our, uh, our result in our notation, I'll call it Z of rho Feynman for the moment, the thing you get by summing the Feynman graphs. is we integrate the U matrix between two times, which I'll call T plus and minus, and which are eventually going to go respectively to plus and minus infinity. The bare vacuum, the U matrix, time ordered exponential minus I integral between T minus and T plus. The real interaction Hamiltonian, G psi bar star star of x plus the new term, rho phi i integrated d 4 x vacuum. That's certainly what from which we get that object from which we got the Feynman rules for vacuum to vacuum in the presence of rho. Actually, it may look like I'm getting palsy because I wrote this a little high. The reason is I want to divide it by something. I'll write down what I want to divide it by, the same thing without the row. You understand, I trust, that the x goes from plus inf the space part of x goes from plus infinity to minus infinity. We only have a restriction on the time part. This is the sum of all vacuum to vacuum graphs. The dis it, can it cancels out the disconnected vacuum bubbles that may be in our graphs. You may say, oh, there's no need to cancel out the disconnected vacuum bubbles because we've got our counter term to normalize the energy properly, and therefore the disconnected vacuum bubbles are canceled. That's what I showed in an earlier lecture. However, I showed that within the framework of our theory with the adiabatic turning on and off. The disconnected vacuum bubbles are indeed canceled in the real theory without an adiabatic turning on and off. There's no harm in dividing by this thing because uh, we're dividing by one, which is always a harmless operation. On the other hand, if the disconnected vacuum bubbles are not canceled off, now that we no longer have an adiabatic turning in and on and off, we'll put this in to divide them out. We'll see in a moment whether they are canceled out or whether they are not canceled out. Any questions about this formula? Anyone who does not instantly see that this is the sum of all the Feynman graphs for the vacuum to vacuum transition in the presence of rho should ask me a question. That's the bare vacuum? Mm -hmm. It is always the bare vacuum that entered into our derivation of the Feynman rules because we took the interaction picture fields, which were free fields, and shoved all the free particle A's to the right and all the free particle A adjoints to the left where they vanished because they encountered the bare vacuum. Okay. The big problem, as we will see, will be what turns the bare vacuum into the physical vacuum. So the answer will be yes, like I told you it is. And you'll see what turns it into the physical vacuum in a moment. Well, once again, rho is nice for writing compact expressions. But we expand out the terms involving rho and write gn Feynman of x1 to xn, the object we wish to show is the real gn we have on the other side, is bare vacuum. The whole thing is time ordered. <coughs> Exponential minus i limit. Sorry, left out that limit. T 
minus to t plus hi of x d4x. There's that whole thing all sitting inside the time ordering, and also sitting inside the time ordering is phi i of x1. And there's a denominator that I'll just write quotes for because it's the same denominator as before. That doesn't involve rho. This is the coefficient of rho of x1 dot 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 rho of xn in the expansion of this object by the same reasoning that we went through for that object. Now to go on, it's now very convenient to realize that both the right and the left hand sides are symmetric under interchange of the arguments x1 to xn. So therefore, with no loss of generality, I will take these things to be time ordered to wit t1, the time part of x1, greater than or equal to t2, greater than or equal to tn. And since t plus and t minus are going to plus and minus infinity, I might as well look at the begin evaluating my limit at a stage when t plus is greater than all of the t's and t minus is less than all of the t's. In this case, <coughs> the time ordering inside here of these objects is rather trivial. We have the exponential integral from t plus to t1. And then we have the field at point t1. Then we have the exponential integral from t1 to t2, etc. Thus we obtain, in this case, the expression for the thing we compute as the sum of the Feynman graphs which gets the still limit. t plus or minus goes to plus and minus infinity. Up in the numerator, we have the vacuum. Our good old friend, the interaction picture U matrix, going from t plus to t1, phi i of x1, ui, which is itself, of course, a time-ordered integral, t1 to t2, of t2 all the way down, dot, 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 for i of tn, u of tn, t minus, vacuum. Make some room here. Oh, uh, x, of course. The field is a function of four variables, of which the fourth is t, or the zeroth, I guess. <coughs> Divided by vacuum ui of t plus comma t minus vacuum. Now, <coughs> a little more algebra. The group property of the u's tells me that u, for example, of t minus and t1 can be written as u of t minus n0, ui's, I should say, ui of 0 and t1. We also know that we can use the ui to find the Heisenberg fields in terms of the interacting picture fields. From a previous lecture, we have the formula phi h of x equals <coughs> u i of 0 and t phi i of x u i of t and 0 the adjoint. Remember, the interaction picture could take, uh, the interaction picture U matrix takes us from the Schrodinger picture to the interaction picture, from the interaction picture to the Heisenberg picture, and this is how it takes us from the interaction picture to the Heisenberg picture. And thus, we see we're getting at least part of this formula in here. We're getting a string of Heisenberg fields, because if we break up each of these U's into going from T to 0 and then from 0 to the next T, we find associated with each phi i is exactly those operators required to turn it into a phi h. 
Thus we get GN Feynman equals, still got to do the limit, goes to infinity, vacuum UI of T plus N zero, phi H of X one, phi h of xn with no u's in between, just a string of phi's, time ordered because of our convention, ui of 0 and t minus vacuum. And I'll break up the denominator in the same convenient way. ui of t plus and 0, ui question about that, I hope. Or if there are questions, ask it. Notice we are halfway there. We have almost the same expression we have here. Things are automatically time ordered by our convention on how we've arranged the x's. We've <coughs> regained the Heisenberg fields. The only thing is, instead of the physical vacuum, we have this funny object here, the bare vacuum and a leftover U matrix. Okay. Is everyone clear? The algebra may be dull. I hope it is not obscure. It's clear to everyone. It's just, you know, straightforward algebra using standard formulas, this one and this one, to turn this expression into this expression, into this expression, into this expression. Now, we got to worry about what happens as t plus and t minus goes to infinity. Much as we hate to do it, there will be times in this course where we have to think seriously about limits, and this is one of them. <laughs> okay, so, so I can erase everyone. No one is going to ask a question later. I can erase this blackboard. <laughs> I expanded in powers of rho and extracted out the coefficient of rho of x1. I didn't do it in detail because I did it in detail with the stuff I erased. Oh, phi, no, of course there is. Phi in general does not commute with HI at unequal times. That's why I need a time ordering symbol outside here. The, ones, um, that are to get added, the whole thing is time ordered. The, yeah, but the ones that are equal times will commute. Those ones equal times will commute, I assume. It's true, there are technical difficulties when one has in derivative interactions, so pi's as well as phi's enter hi. I will ignore those technical difficulties in this discussion for the moment, much later on when we encounter realistic theories with derivative interactions like the electrodynamics of spinless mesons. I will devote an incredibly boring lecture to straightening everything out for derivative interactions and showing they have no effect. That's basically just a lot of dull combinatorics, but it takes care of itself. So. Now, the, um, so, what we have to study is this. We have two limits. We should be able to take them in any order. We'll take them one at a time. I'll let it turn out it doesn't matter what order we take them in. So suppose I wish to study, for example, the limit as t minus goes to minus infinity of some fixed state, which is actually all of the garbage on the board, <laughs> ui of 0 and t minus. on the bare vacuum. Okay, that's the sort of limit we want to study if we first hold t plus fix and then send t minus to infinity. Now, <coughs> ui of 0 and t minus is, again, by a standard formula developed in the lect original lecture on the interaction picture. u of 0 and t minus 
e to the, e to the plus i h0 t minus. Also, just so you'll know, the other side can be done step by step with bras replacing kets. Ui of t plus and 0 is e to the i h0 t plus u of t plus and 0. So everything we're going to do for the vacuum on the right, we can equally well do for the vacuum on the left. Therefore, <coughs> Ui of 0 and t minus acting on the vacuum, bare vacuum, is u of 0 and t minus acting on the bare vacuum, is e to the i h t minus, since we now have no adiabatic turning on and off function and our Hamiltonian is time independence, it's trivial to write down the u matrix acting on the bare vacuum. Now, to compute psi, our limit, we will insert in this expression between here and here a complete set of energy eigenstates of the exact Hamiltonian. That is our privilege and is, of course, the nice way to compute a matrix element of this kind. So I introduce a complete set of states, Hn equals Enn, and sum over that complete set of states. Thus I have limit t minus goes to minus infinity, psi, ui of 0 and t minus vacuum equals Limit t minus goes to minus infinity, sum on n. Of course, really it's an integral, not a sum, but I use standard quantum mechanics conventions and write it as a sum. It's a continuum set of states. Not equal to the vacuum state, the physical vacuum. That's one of our energy eigenstates. I'll separate that out. Psi n, n naught, e to the i, e n t minus plus a term that's independent of t minus, so I don't have to write the limit since the physical vacuum has energy 0. Psi, 0 physical, 0 physical, 0 bare. That's a complete set of energy eigenstates, the ground state of the theory and everything else. Now, the limit is very easy to see. Because what do we have here? We have a continuum integral of oscillating terms. We have a continuum integral because the vacuum, in any physically sensible theory, is the only normalizable state of energy zero, of a, a only normalizable energy eigenstate. There are one particle, two particle, three particle energy eigenstates, but they're in the middle of a continuum. They aren't normalizable states. So we have here a continuum integral of oscillating terms. In fact, although that's not, it's not necessary, they have a minimum frequency of oscillation, which is the energy of the lightest particle in the theory, the mass of the lightest particle in the theory. That's the energy of the lowest energy eigenstate above the vacuum, <coughs> whatever it may be. Now, there's a well-known theorem, which you all know because you all know Fourier transforms, that says if I have a continuum integral of oscillating terms, and I look at the limit as t goes to infinity, it goes to zero all the oscillations cancel out. This is known as the riemann lebesgue lemma. Hmm? It's also the feature, uh, you all know that if you take the Fourier transform of a continuous function and you look at it for large values of the Fourier argument, you get zero. It goes to zero, it's gotta do that, so Parseval's equality will be right. <laughs> Beginning of next lecture, so ask them now, <laughs> when it's fresh in your mind. Yes? This is a general formula from our lecture on the interaction picture. You may remember it better in this form with the t plus on the left and the zero on the right. Because then when you differentiate this, you get an h from here and an h naught from here, and we drag things together and got the interaction Hamiltonian. Do you remember that? This is the adjoint of this one. It was
with the T on the other side. Oh, I had a plus sign. I should have had a minus sign. You're right. Because T minus is on the other side. Okay. The line below that says, since H naught acting on the bare vacuum is zero, U of zero and T minus acting on this UI is the same as U. And since the actual Hamiltonian is time independent, U is E to the IH times the time difference. Okay, we no longer have an adiabatic turning on and off function. We have a real time independent Hamiltonian with energy eigenstates and all that. And therefore, U is just E to the, I, e to the minus IH, parentheses, zero minus T minus. Are you with me? Is that a satisfactory answer? Okay. Well, I'm a little confused about when we're using Schrodinger states and when we're using Heisenberg states. These are fixed states. These are fixed states. All of they are either Schrodinger or Heisenberg or any old picture states at time zero. All the time evolution. Okay? Yeah. Okay? All the time evolution is explicitly there either in the operators or in the use. Okay, the states have no time index. Uh -huh. <coughs> Okay? Yeah. Yes, sir. That's right. That wouldn't go to zero, of course, because it's a discrete ter single term. It's not part of a continuum integral. That's right. It would cancel out of the numerator and denominator. Okay. It wouldn't matter. Okay. Now, <clears throat> of course, exactly the same rule by exactly the same reasoning applies to limit T plus goes to infinity, bare vacuum, UI of T plus and zero, psi, that's equal to zero, zero physical, zero physical, oh, uh, sorry, psi. That's just the adjoint equation. We are now in a position to evaluate our limit for G and F, because we have precisely that kind of limit for both T plus and T minus. Therefore, we can first let T minus go to minus infinity, and then let T plus go to minus plus infinity, or vice versa, the order doesn't matter. We get the same thing. And the result is, <coughs> it's the time limit that takes, makes the bare vacuum into the physical vacuum. Up here, let's do the T plus one first. Zero, zero physical, zero physical. That's the result of this thing times whatever blob is on the right. What's on the right is phi h of x1 phi h of xn. Now we do the second limit. Zero physical, zero physical, zero. Now we'll do the same thing in the denominator. For fixed x1 to xn, these are numbers. So the limit of the product is the uh, limit of the ratio. is the ratio of the limits. I have zero, zero physical, zero physical, times what's ever on the right. What's on the right is zero physical, zero physical, zero. <laughs> zero physical, zero physical equals one. That's how we've normalized the vacuum. This, sorry, the key should be outside here. This cancels this, this cancels this. <laughs> and we have answered question one in the positive. The thing we get by summing up all the Feynman graphs is indeed the actual Green's function as we have defined it. The time ordering symbol is, of course, irrelevant because we have arranged things so that x1, the x1 is later than x2 is later than x3. Thus, we have successfully, in in fact, just as I said, one half hour's work, answered question one. It's nice, it's tricky, but it's pretty. The tricky part is this. By taking the time limit, we wash out everything except the real physical vacuum state. 
back. We see that, in fact, that this is the, the bare vacuum that we get here, but it really doesn't matter. It could be practically any normalizable state, and we would get the same answer. It happens that the Feynman rules given to us for the bare vacuum. This sort of limit <coughs> always, no matter what you've got here, always extracts out the physical vacuum part because everything else gives you a continuous oscillation, and as p gets very large, you have the phase cancellations that make Fourier transforms go to zero, and everything else goes to zero. What if there are no hmm? So what? Nothing. I haven't got That's the answer to question two, what if there are bound states. I've computed this thing. This is not an asymptotic quantity the ground state expectation value of a string of Heisenberg fields. Okay, this part of the formula is golden, just so long as there is a nice, unique, normalizable vacuum state. If we happen to be in a bizarre theory in which there were 72 normalizable vacuum states, of course, we get the sum over the 72 normalizable vacuum states here. But an eigenstate of the mass operator is not the same. A normalizable eigenstate of P squared, P mu squared, is not the same as a nor normalizable eigenstate of the energy. One particle states are all, any one particle wave packet is a normalizable state that's an eigenstate of P mu squared. But it's not an eigenstate of energy. To get an eigenstate of energy from a one particle state, you have to make a plane wave, and that is not a normalizable state. Okay, when this into sum, or more properly integral, runs over the one particle states, it goes from the mass of the particle up to infinity, because the S, the energy a single particle can have, depending upon whether it's at rest or moving with infinite velocity. It's a continuum integral there. Okay. The only normalizable energy eigenstate is the vacuum. Okay. Are you with me? Now we turn, unless there are other questions. Are there other questions? Yes, sir. No, only if there is a fixed state. As we say in, uh, in Hilbert's base theory, this is a weak limit, not a strong limit. It's a limit in the weak topology, not in the strong topology. It could hardly be true without that, because after all, this is a unitary operator. Okay, the norm of this state is always one. Okay, it's the only way it could turn the bare vacuum into the physical vacuum is if it had no, uh, no multiplying factor like this. And we know this. We know from our model theories that we can solve exactly that typically this inner product is not equal to one. It's only true with a fixed state. Okay? But that's all I've proved it for. That's all we need it for. We're studying matrix elements. We aren't. Okay. I mean, I, I, you get me on a subject like this, and I jump up and down and say the same thing five times over. But you understand. No. Okay. Now that we've established this, we turn to question two. That is to say, how do we construct the S matrix? And how do we, that is to say, how do we construct in and out states? This has nothing to do with perturbation theory and nothing to do with, um, with breaking the Hamiltonian up into two parts. It's just the question of, if you are given these GNs, how do I compute the matrix, how do I compute the S matrix in terms of them? Therefore, since it has, <coughs> Nothing to do with perturbation theory. And <coughs> since I will always be working in the Heisenberg picture, and since I hate writing down a lot of subscripts, from now on, for the remainder of this lecture and the first part of next lecture, I will denote phi h of x just by phi over at phi of x, the Heisenberg picture field. The physical vacuum is the only vacuum we'll ever talk about, so I'll call it zero. And I remind you that is a state 
such that it has an eigenstate of the exact energy and momentum with eigenvalue 0 and is normalized to 1. And we will have physical one meson states in our theory, I hope. Otherwise, maybe they don't. Maybe the meson becomes unstable. But in that case, there's no point in trying to compute meson-meson scattering matrix elements. I will relativistically normalize them. They are eigenstates of the exact Hamilton of the exact uh, momentum operator. I don't know why I lowered the index for there, but I'm not going to erase it. Where k0 is omega k equals square root of k squared plus mu squared, where that is the real mass of the meson, the real energy of a real one meson state at rest. And we normalize our states in a relativistic way are just notational conventions. I don't write down the normalization for a two meson state because a two meson at the moment, because a two meson state could be either a two meson in state or a two meson out state, and they aren't the same things. A state that looks like two mesons in the far past may look like a nucleon and an antinucleon in the far future. One of the problem we're going to confront is how to construct those states. At the moment, we'll have troubles enough playing around with just the vacuum and the one particle states. Now, since the computations we're going to go through are long, I should give you a little bit of a vague overview to begin with and tell you what we're going to do. We're going to be inspired by this limiting process here. You may have been discouraged by it, but I am going to be inspired by it. <laughs> In this limiting process, we saw how we could pluck out the vacuum state. We chose to pluck it out of the bare vacuum, but as I said, we could have plucked it out of any normalizable state by the same arguments how we could pluck out the vacuum state by taking some object involving finite times and going to a limit. We're going to do the same sort of thing. Our field operators, since they're interacting field operators, are not going to make one particle states when they hit the vacuum. That is to say, they're not going to make only one particle states. They'll make one particle states, and two particle states, and three particle states, and 72 particle states. They're capable of doing a lot. But, well, I guess in our theory, they make them in even numbers. No, that's not true. They can make them one at a time. They can, uh, no, one, two, three, four, any number. What we're going to do is try and going to go through a long sequence of definitions to construct a limiting process that will enable me to get from the field operator hitting the vacuum just the one particle part by a time limit. Okay. And then when I do that, I have something like a extract is something like a creation operator for a single particle, defined as a time limit that could either go to time minus infinity or time plus infinity. And then I will be able to use these, quote, creation operators, unquote, to create states that look like two particle states, either in the far past or the far future, by making the time limit go to either minus infinity or plus infinity. All that will be in detail, okay? But the trick is, at first, our first job is to find a time limit that makes a one particle state and exclusively a one particle state. Now, <coughs> to do this first, we'll need some conventions on the scale of our field. Because after all, I said, I'm just going to work with these Heisenberg fields, and I'm not even going to use any details of the equations of motion, just the fact that they are. Phi of x is a local scalar field. I'm not even going to say it's canonical and obeys the canonical commutators. It's just some local scalar field. And I'm going to try and manipulate it. I'm going to have two normalization conditions. One is the vacuum expectation value, the physical vacuum, the Heisenberg field, by translational invariance, is a constant independent of x, simply by applying e to the ip dot x on both sides. 
And therefore, I will always arrange my field so that it has I will subtract from it, if necessary, that self-same constant to arrange so that the vacuum expectation value of phi of x equals 0. I have that freedom to do so. If I have a field that has a non-zero vacuum expectation value, I'll subtract the vacuum expectation value. Secondly, the one particle matrix elements. By the same operation of exponentiating the momentum operators and using the fact that things are momentum eigenstates, one sees that this is EVI k dot x. k is the exact form momentum. k phi of 0 vacuum. By Lorentz invariance, this number, since Lorentz transformations don't change phi of 0 and change any one particles, any one meson state into any other one meson state, this thing must be a number. So this is e the i k dot x times a number, which by convention has the somewhat peculiar name of the square root of z3. <laughs> the convention comes from Dyson's classic papers on, um, on uh, quantum electrodynamics, where he defined a bunch of quantities called z, and this was the third one he got to, and we're stuck with that <laughs> here. We have a Z2 in our theory also. That would be if we were doing the same reasoning for one nucleon state in our theory of mesons and nucleons. That would be called Z2. <laughs> but we'll stick with this one. We'll call it Z3. And Z1 is something we won't get to for a week, so don't worry about it. We're not doing it in Dyson's order. <laughs> anyway, this is a number called the square root of Z3. We define phi prime of x equals z3 to the minus 1 half times our original phi of x. I will assume z3 is not 0, so this definition makes sense. And then phi prime of x has the property that it has the same matrix element to a one particle state as a free field, as between the bare vacuum and the bare one particle state. So I'll write down those two conditions. And of course, for later purposes, it will be convenient to have the adjoint equation. Okay, these are just matters of definition. Phi prime is called the renormalized field, if this is the canonical field obeying canonical commutators. It's called renormalized for an obvious reason. We have changed the normalization. Z3 has a rather dumb name. It should be called the field renormalization constant, but in fact it's called, for reasons so obscure and wrongheaded and so embedded in the early history of quantum electrodynamics, I don't want to describe them, the wave function renormalization constant. It should be called the field renormalization constant. Now I'm in a position to tell you what almost in the answer to my qu our question means. Almost means that the formula, the naive formula we wrote down in question two is right, except the Green's functions we have to compute are those of the renormalized fields, not the Green's functions of the ordinary fields, and differ from it by powers of z3 to the minus one half. <laughs> But we'll see that. We'll, in fact, establish the right formula for the renormalized fields. The renormalized fields have been scaled in such a way that if all they did was create and annihilate single particle states when hitting the vacuum, then they would do it with exa in exactly the same way as a free field. 
They do more than that, and therefore we've got to go into a limiting procedure, which I will now go into. It's actually not bad. It's mainly just writing down a bunch of definitions. And then <coughs> observing what happens. Let me see. Oh, I went through all these pages, and here's the beginning of next lecture, which I'm in the middle of. Okay. Good, and we'll get to the end in 10 minutes. Good. <laughs> Not to the end of the next lecture, but to the end of the part I wrote. <laughs> now, unfortunately, we get into a lot of trouble if we try and do limits involving plane wave states. So I would like to uh, in, uh, develop some notation for normalizable wave packet type states. Let me make sure I invented that notation just for this lecture. I make a normalized wave packet state, which I will denote by little f, by integrating over all k with the usual relativity factor, some function which I will call capital F of k. I don't want to call it little f twiddle for reasons that will become clear in a moment e to the minus i k dot x. Uh, whoops, sorry, wrong formula. k. Associated with this, I will invent a function called f of x, which is obtained by doing exactly the same integral and sticking here e to the minus i minus i or plus i, I better be very careful now, minus i, k dot x, instead of k. Okay, it's the same integral. Yes, sir? Mm -hmm. By Lorentz transformations. I stick a u of lambda here and a u of lambda adjoint and a u of lambda and a u of lambda adjoint here. Yeah, but this is a one particle state. K squared equals mu squared. <laughs> okay. Good. Now. Yeah, I have that. K naught equals omega K. I'll write it down again. Now, the reason, yes, you are. Now, the reason for this is that. The reason I, so I, thus I associate with every one particle state a solution of the Klein-Gordon, of the free Klein-Gordon equation. Box squared, a unique solution, always negative frequency solution. Box squared plus mu squared f of x equals zero. Furthermore, if for a, um, if the one particle state f goes to a plane wave state k, so this thing is 2 pi cubed 2 omega k times a delta function, then f of x goes to the plane wave solution e to the minus i k dot x. So I've arranged a one-to-one -one mapping such that our relativistically normalized, I shouldn't put a vector there, our relativistically normalized states, vector should not be there since it's a relativistically normalized state, our relativistically normalized states correspond to plane waves with no factors in front of them. I'm now going to define what at first glance seems to be an absolutely disgusting object, if I can find the page, which I will call will be only a function of time, and I'm going to apply a time-limiting <coughs> procedure to it. Oops, I'm going to run five minutes over. Phi prime f of t is i. It's only a function of time. It's got a space integral in it, d cubed x, v naught f times phi minus phi 
times d naught f. Remember, phi is a Heisenberg field, a function of x and t. This produces a function of t only. We can say some things about this object. In particular, we know it's vacuum to vacuum matrix elements. Whoops, ooh, I wrote, a, yes, I wrote zero. How clever of me. <laughs> Sorry, f d naught phi, thank you. We know it's vacuum to vacuum matrix element. They are, in fact, independent of time, and that equals zero. We know it's one particle matrix elements. Those are pretty easy, since we know the one particle matrix element of phi. <coughs> K, phi prime f of t, zero, equals, well, what does it equal? Well, we've got a space integral which cancels out the e to the minus i k dot x in this thing and just gives us an f of k and cancels out the 2 pi cube. We still have the 2 omega k left from the definition of the function f. That's got all of this junk and it's got the 2 omega k. We still have an i from our expression. We have the time derivatives. d naught f gives us a minus i omega k. And uh, d naught phi gives us a plus i omega k, but there's a minus sign in front. See, I've set up my conventions nightly, nicely so that this is f of k, which is, in fact, f um, kf, because the inner product has a 2 pi cube, 2, two, two omega k in it. Thus, this operator has time-independent matrix elements from vacuum to vacuum, and has time-independent matrix elements from vacuum to any one particle state. In fact, if we just restrict ourselves to the one particle subspace, at any given time, this is like a creation operator for the normalized state f. Is that clear to everyone? I see one head shaking. That carries. It's clear. <laughs> OK. You may not have followed all the normalization, but you can work those out yourself. You've got all the equations on the board. Yes, sir? Yes. Now, what about any other state? Suppose I take a state n, with some momentum, which I'll call little p mu n, n, some energy and some momentum. If I do exactly the same calculation with any other state here, phi prime f of t vacuum, everything, all of this, <coughs> will be exactly the same, i, of course, be an unknown normalization factor, n phi prime of zero vacuum. But otherwise, I'll have exactly the same sort of matrix element, except instead of an e to the i k dot x, I'll have an e to the i p n dot x. And therefore, I'll have minus i omega k from differentiating the f, minus i e n from differentiating this, but now I will have the real killer, either the plus i e n minus omega k t. I will have an oscillation factor. Furthermore, since any state other than a one particle state of momentum k, any two particle state, three particle state, four particle state, 72 particle state, for any given value of the two, for any given value of the, um, and k is of course equal to pn, I should have written that. If for any given value of the, um, in fact, why did I write k? I wrote k because I was hasty. It should be pn, omega pn, omega pn. 
has a different energy than a one particle state of the same momentum. And furthermore, you can have a continuum of energies. If you have a two particle state of a given momentum, say momentum zero, that can have all energies ranging from, four mu, from two mu to infinity, depending on the center of mass motion. Thus, if we do the same integral, we have done the same argument we did for the time limit in the vacuum. By inserting a complete set of intermediate states, the vacuum state will give us nothing. Let me write down what we're computing. I'm trying to go too fast. fixed state psi sitting on the right. The vacuum state will give us nothing. The one particle states will give us f independent of time. And everything else in the whole wide world will give us oscillations, which vanish because the same reason they vanish in the vacuum state. That's why I'm running over so I could give you the second argument while the first one was fresh in your mind. Everything else gives you oscillations, and those oscillations cancel out by the good old riemann lebesgue lemma. So this is simply, it's exactly the same formula as we had for the vacuum. The sum over one particle states just gives us a state f. Uh, I'm sorry, over the norm of f squared, of course. The sum of the one particle state just projects onto f. The sum of the uh, over all the higher states gives us zip, nothing. And this should have a prime on it, which I'm continually dropping. OK, is this point perfectly clear to everyone? We have discovered how to extract out of the vacuum a normalizable one particle state with any desired wave function. We construct this object, apply it to the vacuum, and then for any fixed state on the right, we go to the limit either t equals plus infinity or t equals minus infinity, and we just project out the part that lies on the, what, is, what am I writing here? People should. <laughs> Oh, Jesus. <laughs> That's the right formula. Forgive me. We just project out. Jesus Christ. We picked out. I, I'm going crazy. Forgive me. I, I will spend the weekend at McLean's and Rye. No, this is Tuesday. I'll spend Wednesday at McLean's and come back Thursday in better shape. <laughs> the, uh, this is the right formula. I'm sorry. I wrote down total nonsense. This just projects out the part F and gives you this. And therefore, we have something that can act either in the far past or the far future as a creation operator for a normalizable state. Now, this looks very tempting as a prescription to use in a prescription for constructing two particle in states and two particle out states, and therefore S matrix elements. And I will yield to that temptation at the beginning of next lecture. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. 